Hello, and welcome to Managing Exoides Scapularis Bites. The CDC estimates that the annual incidence of Lyme disease exceeds 300,000. This value does not include many patients who were diagnosed with Lyme disease without meeting the CDC's strict surveillance case definition. While most patients were unaware of the tick bite that gave them Lyme disease, proper management of known bites should help to reduce the incidence. The learning objectives are listed here. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Maloney, and I developed and narrate this module. I have no financial conflicts to disclose. Off-label use of antibiotics will be discussed. It's not unusual for patients to bring in a container holding something they remove from their body. Imagine this situation. A 47-year-old gentleman comes in on a busy Monday morning in Min Bay and tells you that he was in tick habitat over the weekend and last night removed what he thinks is a tick from his right shin. It's in the bag he just handed you. Since he clearly expects action, what should you do? Your first task is for you to determine what you're looking at. Patients may mistake other things, other arachnids, biting insects, small scabs, or foreign bodies for ticks. Although it's pretty small, you're able to determine that your patient was right. It's a tick. The United States is home to many species of hard ticks, and since different ticks transmit different pathogens, being able to identify tick species is an important skill. Tick identification is primarily based on knowing which ticks are located where and what they look like. The ranges of several tick species are outlined on this map. You can see that there is considerable overlap, and many regions of the country had three or more species to contend with. Although it's unreasonable to expect you to know the range of each species, you should know which ticks are in your area. Armed with a magnifying glass and good reference photos, you should be able to distinguish tick species based on their appearance. Looking at the top three photos, the scutum, that's the shield-like area on the dorsum just behind the head, is a different color. And while it may be more challenging to distinguish the scuttle color of the brown dog tick from the black-legged tick, both are clearly different from that of the American dog tick. The lone star tick with a single white dot is easier to identify. By the way, although brown dog ticks are ubiquitous throughout the U.S., they rarely bite humans. These three species aren't as widely distributed as those we just looked at and can be a little trickier to identify. Looking at the Rocky Mountain wood tick, you can see that the festoons, which are the small plates at the periphery of the dorsal shell, are more pronounced than in other species. The Pacific Coast tick's white scutum is very similar to that of the American dog tick, but it tends to be more punctated. Plus, the Pacific Coast tick has projections at the base of its head that the American dog tick lacks. The white scutum of the Gulf Coast tick is striped. Females have a single black stripe, while males have multiple stripes. Size is not a reliable way to tell tick species apart. Although the diagram on the left accurately depicts the relative size of the black-legged, lone star, and American dog ticks, feeding disrupts that relationship. Looking at the two fed ticks on the right, you can see that size alone is insufficient for identifying their species. Applying what you just learned about appearance, what species of ticks are you looking at? Pausing the program will give you time to respond. The answers will appear when you resume. Black-legged ticks are the only recognized vector of Lyme disease. The photo on the left shows an adult female. In the photo on the right, you see adult female, adult male, nymph, and larva. That's a centimeter ruler on the bottom, indicating that the nymph is roughly a millimeter in size, or about as big as a poppy seed. One patient I know described the attached tick she discovered as a freckle with legs. The ranges of the eastern and western black-legged ticks are shown here. Research done over the last 10 years demonstrates marked expansion of exoides scapularis range. Deer and other mammals transport ticks locally. Migratory birds, on the other hand, 
can and do transport ticks hundreds or thousands of miles. This can introduce ticks into suitable habitat in regions well beyond their historical ranges. The extent of the role that migratory birds play in range expansion is not fully understood. Black-legged ticks have a two-year life cycle. During this time, they transition through four stages and depending on their sex, feed two or three times. Animal hosts vary, reflecting differences in the tick's life stage and local habitat. Ticks acquire Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease, when they feed on an infected host. Once infected, they remain infected and subsequent feedings provide new opportunities to transmit the bacteria. A single infected reservoir host can infect many ticks over its lifespan. Reservoir hosts are the animal species which maintain the infection in between periods of active transmission and are necessary for Borrelia burgdorferi survival. White-footed mice are the primary reservoir hosts in much of the country, but chipmunks, shrews, and other mammals fill that ecological niche in some locales. Humans, dogs, horses, and other domesticated animals are incidental hosts. They can become infected but are not essential for the bacteria's survival. Deer are not competent hosts for Borrelia burgdorferi. Their role is to provide a place for adult ticks to congregate and mate. Pause the presentation to answer these two questions. The answers will appear when you resume the slideshow. So what exactly is in your patient's plastic bag? For the sake of this presentation, let's say it's a nymphal black-legged tick. Knowing the tick's species and stage is crucial information, but if you're going to manage a tick by properly, you'll need to know more. Risk-benefit analyses consider several factors, how long the tick was attached, the likelihood that it was infected, the potential that it transmitted other pathogens, and patient-specific factors such as age and medication allergies. Management decisions should not be based on serologic testing done immediately after a bite. In fact, it's inappropriate to order tests for that purpose. Serology looks for antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi, and because it takes several weeks for an antibody response to develop, negative results would be the norm in that setting. Positive results would be indicative of previous exposure. It's important to recognize that patients with a recent tick bite who are symptomatic or who have an erythema migrans rash require treatment, not prophylaxis. To manage a known bite, you need to consider the details of that specific case. Individual patients aren't interested in the average risk of all known bites. They only care about the risk posed from their bite. You can calculate the risk of a specific bite using this equation. The risk of disease transmission equals a transmission rate multiplied by the big Burgdorferi infection rate in the population that the tick came from. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as it would seem. There are several reasons why this is true. One, Borrelia Burgdorferi infection rates in specific tick populations has rarely been studied. Two, infection rates vary from year to year in the same locale. And three, Transmission rate values are often uncertain. Transmission rates are time dependent. The longer an infected tick is attached, the more likely it is to transmit Lyme disease. That's a pretty straightforward concept. You can see from this transmission model that the relationship between attachment time and transmission isn't linear. A small change in the attachment time can have a significant impact on the estimated transmission rate. Because it would be unethical to infect human subjects, this model was developed in mice. Several infected ticks were placed on uninfected mice and left to feed on individual mice for different periods of time. Some mice were fed on for 24 hours, others 48, 72, 96, or less if the ticks dropped off on their own. The mice were subsequently sacrificed and examined for the presence of B. burgdorferi. Researchers were then able to construct a transmission model that estimates the likelihood of transmission for a given feeding duration.
One study by Peisman found a 7% transmission rate for attachments under 24 hours. But this finding was based on the simultaneous feedings of several ticks. More recently, when mice were exposed to a single infected tick, there was no evidence of transmission for durations less than 24 hours. In theory, if you know how long a tick was attached, you can use the model to estimate the likelihood that it transmitted B. burgdorferi, provided the tick was actually infected. Determining a tick's attachment time isn't always easy. Patients may report an estimate based on their personal observations, but studies suggest that they tend to underestimate attachment times. Physicians could determine the attachment time based on the tick scuttle index, which is calculated by dividing abdominal length by scuttle width. By comparing the scuttle index of their tick to observed scuttle indices of known feeding durations, physicians could work backwards, so to speak, to estimate how long the tick was attached. But the clinical reality is that few physicians have the training or tools to estimate scuttle indices. The good news is that careful inspection and comparison to photos of fed ticks may be sufficient. One question that frequently comes up when discussing disease transmission is whether there's a grace period, and if so, how long it may last. 24 hours is frequently cited as the minimum attachment time necessary for transmission because it accounts for findings from the transmission studies that did not detect B. burgdorferi transmission when ticks fed for less than 24 hours. So what's the thinking here? This diagram depicts the bacteria in its typical location within the tick midgut. A magnified view reveals that Borrelia burgdorferi is anchored in place to receptors in the wall of the tick's gut via outer surface protein A. Before the bacteria can migrate from the midgut to the salivary gland and into a new host, it must first detach from the gut wall. The 24-hour theory suggests it takes this much time for the migratory process to play out. Migration isn't constantly occurring. It's a controlled process, one that's initiated when host blood enters a tick's gut. This environmental change acts as a signal to Borrelia burgdorferi that it's time to move. To accomplish that, the production of outer surface protein A has to be downregulated because this allows the bacteria to become untethered from the gut wall. Given that the downregulation of outer surface protein A expression isn't instantaneous and the transmission findings I mentioned earlier, the 24-hour grace period theory seems to make sense. However, several variables could have an impact on the duration of the grace period, and in some instances, there may not even be one. Transmission models are based on uninterrupted feeding, yet ticks are known to sometimes attach to a host, detach, and then reattach to the same host or a new one. This behavior has been observed with mouse hosts and in the human xenodiagnostic trial. Researchers using mouse hosts found that ticks which were initially attached for at least 16 hours were subsequently infectious within 24 hours of reattachment. So it appears that the 24-hour clock starts with the first attachment. Findings from Peisman and colleagues adds to the uncertainty about the duration of the grace period because they documented that Borrelia burgdorferi was present in the salivary glands of some ticks prior to feeding. The transmission studies were done with Exoides scapularis ticks, and it's possible that transmission rates may differ by tick species. Taken together, it's clear that the assumed 24-hour grace period is far from guaranteed, but that does not mean that the transmission model is without value. It can still be used to get a rough estimate of the transmission risk for a given attachment time. For example, after 60 hours of attachment, we can expect that roughly half of all infected ticks will transmit the infection to their new host. For our case study, we know your patient was bitten by a black-legged nymph. Let's assume 30% of the nymphs in the area are infected and that the tick was attached for 54 hours. 
Plugging this duration into the transmission model reveals that the corresponding transmission risk is 25%. Multiplying that by the 30% infection rate, we find that the risk for this particular bite would be 7.5%. The only cost-benefit analysis of antibiotic prophylaxis for Lyme disease based its calculations on a two-week doxycycline protocol. The study authors concluded that prophylaxis was cost-effective when the risk of infection was greater than 3.6%. Thus, your patient's 7.5% risk warrants a recommendation for prophylaxis. You also need to consider the possibility that your patient was exposed to other pathogens. Here's a chance to practice risk estimations. Pause the video to calculate the risks for cases one and two under the circumstances noted. Because the risk is based on two independent variables, imposing strict criteria must be done with care. Otherwise, patients who have bites which merit prophylaxis may go untreated. Tick-borne diseases is a global term for all of the illnesses that are tick transmitted. Co-infections is more specific, referring only to infections transmitted by black-legged ticks. It should be noted that each pathogen can cause disease in the absence of B. burgdorferi. Here's a list of other pathogens that are transmitted by Ixodes scapularis ticks. The next few slides discuss the epidemiology and presentation of these infections. Anaplasma phagocytophyllum is the bacterial agent of anaplasmosis. This pathogen invades PMNs. The arrow on the microscopy image shows a morula, which is a cluster of the bacteria at the periphery of the PMN cytoplasm. Symptoms are nonspecific and flu-like. Chills, fever, myalgia, and headache are most common, but nausea, abdominal pain, and confusion have been reported. The incidence is highest in middle-aged adults, but the greatest mortality is seen in young children and the elderly. Doxycycline is a preferred antibiotic, even in children less than eight years old. Infection with any one of several Babesia species may give rise to Babesiosis. The map indicates areas of the country that are most affected. Individual species tend to cluster into distinct geographic locations but there is some overlap. Babesia microti is the predominant species in the eastern half of the country. This red blood cell parasite, shown in the top photo, has a life cycle that parallels that of malaria. Transmission is primarily via tick bite. Maternal fetal transmission and transfusion related cases have been documented. Symptoms of acute disease develop weeks to months after the bite and the severity of the disease is variable. Immunocompromised patients and those infected with Babesia divergens are more likely to have severe disease. Symptoms are similar to those of malaria and commonly include fever, chills, night sweats, myalgias, and arthralgia. GI symptoms such as anorexia, nausea, and vomiting are also frequently seen. Babesiosis can also be chronic and or subacute. Documented transfusion transmitted cases have occurred and the American Red Cross screens for Babesia in endemic areas. Recent FDA guidance on Babesia and the blood supply states that donors with reactive Babesia nucleic acid test results are deferred for a period of at least two years from the date of the test. Borrelia miyamotoi, a member of the relapsing fever group of Borrelia, is capable of producing an illness with symptoms that overlap those of Lyme disease. Like Borrelia burgdorferi, this pathogen can infect multiple tissues. Symptoms are nonspecific and multisystemic. Fever, chills, severe headache, and myalgia are frequently seen. Sporadic cases have apparent CNS involvement, producing dizziness and confusion. Although a few cases were associated with an erythema migrans-like rash, this is an uncommon finding. The pathogens responsible for Poisson disease are deer tick viruses. 
flavi viruses and their vectors vary by region. Both infections produce severe encephalitis and symptoms rapidly progress from fever and headache to paralysis and sometimes death. The mortality rate ranges from 10 to 15 percent and roughly half of all survivors have neurologic sequelae. Although the transmission of Bartonella via tick bites is still debated, it's included here because there is evidence supporting tick transmission. Black-legged ticks in the U.S. are known to harbor Bartonella, and case reports have documented patients simultaneously infected with Bartonella and other black-legged tick-transmitted pathogens. Several different Bartonella species have been associated with disease. It appears that different species have different primary reservoir hosts. The pathogens reside in endothelial cells, but also infect erythrocytes. Bartonella species are capable of producing multisystemic disease with widespread nonspecific symptoms, including fever, fatigue, headache, arthralgias, myalgias, and sore throat. Neurologic involvement may produce visual changes, numbness, poor balance, ataxia, cognitive deficits, and diminished memory. Insomnia is not uncommon. Because black-legged ticks can transmit multiple pathogens, it's important to know that the minimum attachment time for disease transmission varies widely. Poisson virus and anaplasma phagocytophyllum are readily transmitted in less than 24 hours. Recognizing that a single black-legged tick bite can transmit multiple infections complicates an already uncertain situation. The additional pathogen burden may increase the severity or distort the presentation of the underlying Lyme disease. And because many co-infections produce symptoms similar to Lyme disease, it can be difficult to distinguish between these illnesses on clinical grounds. The lack of rapid diagnostic testing for most co-infections means that lab results are unlikely to provide a quick solution to a diagnostic dilemma. Co-infections complicate therapeutic decisions. While some respond to doxycycline, the first-line agent for Lyme disease, others, like Babesia, do not. There isn't any trial evidence to guide the management of patients with multiple tick-borne infections, so it's unclear whether we should treat the pathogen simultaneously or sequentially. It's also unclear whether the outcomes for the individual infections present in a multiply infected patient are comparable to what is seen when a patient has but a single infection. Therefore, we don't know whether to use standard regimens or to adjust the dose and or duration of the selected antibiotics. It would be ideal to offer patients prophylactic regimens that prevent all black-legged tick transmitted diseases, but that possibility hasn't been explored. Because the gentleman in this case had a known bite with a 7.5% risk for Lyme disease, antibiotic prophylaxis is the only primary prevention strategy that's still an option. Although some clinicians prefer to offer watchful waiting, it's important to recognize that this is an example of secondary prevention, not primary. It's also risky. According to the CDC statistics, 30% of the cases meeting the surveillance case definition lack the described erythema migrans rash. Prophylaxis options include the use of single-dose doxycycline or multi-day regimens. The currently popular practice of using a single 200 milligram dose of doxycycline for known black-legged tick bites is based on a single study conducted by Nadelman and colleagues. In this randomized placebo-controlled trial, Subjects in the treatment arm received one 200 milligram dose of doxycycline. The primary endpoint was the development of an erythema migrans rash at the bite site, and the trial had a six week observation period. Although the authors reported that treatment was 87% effective, the associated confidence interval was wide, suggesting that clinical efficacy was likely to be around 50%. It's critical to understand that this value pertains only to the prevention of an erythema migrans rash at the bite site and not prevention of the disease itself. That's because the trial had a flawed design. 
its six-weeks observation period was too short to determine whether or not treatment prevented subjects from developing manifestations of late disease, which can occur months to years after a bite. The designated endpoint made it impossible to correctly identify all cases of early Lyme disease. Three subjects had symptoms consistent with early disease and seroconverted, but because they never developed an erythema migrans rash, they were not counted as disease positives. Thus, the reported efficacy doesn't apply to all cases of early disease. In addition to its limited efficacy, single-dose doxycycline has another drawback. It can produce a seronegative disease state. The subject in the treatment arm who did not develop an erythema migrans rash remained seronegative on follow-up testing. Considering the unknown efficacy for preventing all manifestations of Lyme disease and the safety concern regarding seronegative disease, you and your patient may prefer to look at other therapeutic options. One such option is to use a multi-day antibiotic regimen. Three human trials investigated this possibility using 10 days of penicillin, amoxicillin, or doxycycline. However, none of them demonstrated that antibiotic therapy was efficacious. So how can it be that 10 days of these antibiotics had no apparent efficacy when a single dose of doxycycline was able to demonstrate some efficacy for EM prevention? The answer is fairly straightforward. The infection rate in the placebo arms of the multi-day trials was so low that it was essentially impossible to demonstrate that treatment could reduce the risk of infection. Yet, there is support for a multi-day approach. Two mouse studies demonstrated that a longer duration of doxycycline therapy could be beneficial. Let's look at those mouse studies, which were done by Zeidner and colleagues of the CDC. In the first study, Lyme-infected ticks were placed on mice and allowed to feed. The mice were divided into three groups. One group received an oral dose of doxycycline that was selected on the basis of pharmacokinetics to produce blood levels equivalent to those in humans who received a single 200 milligram dose. Mice in a second group received a single injection of a long-acting doxycycline, and a third group received placebo. The animals were ultimately sacrificed and examined for the presence of Borrelia burgdorferi. Researchers found that the long-acting injectable doxycycline was 100% effective. Oral single-dose doxycycline was only 43% effective. A second study used the same design, except that the ticks were infected with both Borrelia burgdorferi and Anaplasma phagocytophyllum. Here, the long-acting preparation remained 100% effective for both pathogens but the oral agent was only 30% effective for preventing anaplasmosis and its efficacy for preventing Lyme disease dropped to 20%. The pharmacokinetics of the long-acting doxycycline agent are intriguing. Although blood levels were measurable for 19 days, after the first 24 hours, they were well below the established MIC, yet the regimen was 100% effective. This raises questions regarding the relative importance of treatment duration versus antibiotic dose. The multi-day doxycycline option holds promise, especially because it could also prevent anaplasmosis. But without human trial evidence, it's not a sure thing. And it would be even more speculative to replace doxycycline with other agents such as amoxicillin or cefuroxine. Topical agents have been studied and found to be non-efficacious. Azithromycin was effective in mouse studies, but not in humans. With regard to prophylaxis, there are several other questions to consider. Borrelia burgdorferi senso stricto, the agent of Lyme disease in the U.S., belongs to the broader Borrelia burgdorferi sensu lato complex. Of the nearly two dozen identified species, a few are known pathogens and cause the bulk of recognized cases, while several others are responsible for sporadic cases. This raises two questions. One, which sensolato species are pathogenic? And two, would antibiotic regimens that are effective for Borrelia burgdorferi sensostricto, 
work equally well for these other species. Additionally, since we now know that Borrelia miyamotoi can cause an illness with some overlapping symptoms, might other species in the relapsing fever group do likewise? It would also be interesting to study whether or not other ticks transmit Borrelia burgdorferi. For instance, we know that lone star bites are associated with an illness that produces a rash and symptoms very reminiscent of Lyme disease, but culture from these patients are never positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. Because the pathogen remains unidentified, the illness has been labeled Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, or STARI. But should we be so quick to dismiss Lyme as a diagnosis? We know that the Lone Star Tick can harbor Borrelia burgdorferi, but because the ability to acquire the pathogen is not evidence of transmissibility, the question becomes whether this tick is a competent vector for Borrelia burgdorferi. Clark reported a case series that suggested it is, but other researchers subsequently challenged his findings. Bottom line, the jury is still out on this one. Another possibility is that the Lone Star tick is transmitting an unrecognized Borrelia species or strain that isn't detectable with tests geared towards Borrelia burgdorferi senso stricto. Getting back to our case study, Given all of the uncertainty regarding the likelihood of disease transmission and the lack of human trials demonstrating that antibiotic prophylaxis is efficacious, what would you do under the circumstances? How can you practice evidence-based medicine when there's so little evidence to begin with? For starters, it's important to recognize that while evidence-based medicine leans heavily on clinical research, it also incorporates clinical expertise and patient values. The relative value of these three elements are intention, such that when the evidence is strong, clinical expertise and patient values carry less weight. But when the evidence is weak, clinical expertise and patient values assume greater importance. In shared decision-making, clinicians describe the knowns and unknowns of the situation and guide patients through a risk-benefit assessment that looks at the trade-offs of various options from the patient's perspective. This allows clinicians to formulate reasonable treatment plans. In our case study, the estimated risk of Lyme disease for the patient was 7.5%, so antibiotic prophylaxis would be cost-effective. But because the evidence is weak, none of these options have demonstrated superiority. Findings from animal studies and the human trial consistently demonstrated that single-dose doxycycline has low efficacy, and if treatment failure routinely leads to seronegative disease, then the marginal protection may not be worth the risk. The long-acting doxycycline preparation performed well in mice and has the advantage of also preventing anaplasmosis, which is an important consideration for some areas of the country. Although the studies were well designed, one can't assume the same results would be achieved in humans. And since there's no long-acting doxycycline preparation approved for human use, short-acting oral preparations would need to be substituted. This dosing schedule will not achieve the constant blood level seen in the mouse model, but it should be able to sustain levels above that seen in mice. When patient-specific factors preclude the use of doxycycline, substituting other agents into the multi-day scheme is speculative. Whether treatment durations of less than 20 days can remain highly effective is also unknown. Topical azithromycin is ineffective in humans and therefore not an option. It would be great if more human trials of these options were underway, but there aren't any and your patient needs you to make a decision today. You'll need to work with the facts at hand, carefully describing them to your patient, and ultimately making a choice. To summarize, the U.S. is home to many species of hard ticks, and the pathogens they transmit vary by species. Black-legged ticks transmit multiple pathogens, including Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease. The risk that Lyme disease will result from a specific bite is dependent on the duration of tick attachment 
and the likelihood that the tick was infected. This risk increases with attachment time, and although the risk associated with attachment durations of less than 24 hours is very small, it should not assume to be zero. Antibiotic prophylaxis of a known bite is a form of primary prevention. Although animal models suggest that this can be an effective strategy, it has not been proven in human trials. Researchers have studied multi-day regimens of oral agents, single-dose oral doxycycline, a long-acting injectable doxycycline, and several topical agents. Given the scientific uncertainty, it's important that the pros and cons of the first two options be fully discussed with patients before you make your selection. Thank you for viewing this module, Management of Exodus Scapularis Bites.